Welcome to Be The Wellness Podcast, where we help you master your body, mind, and the experience of life through insightful conversation, interviews with experts and thought leaders, all with a side of marital banter and some good old-fashioned humor. Yes, we are your hosts, Adam and Vanessa Lambert, and we're committed to helping you live life fully expressed physically, mentally, and experientially. Sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and join the conversation. Hello and welcome everybody, Be The Wellness Podcast, Adam and Vanessa Lambert. Doing the podcast. Good, yay. <laughs> After 157 episodes, we are we've figured out the second line. <laughs> Doing the podcast thing, I think is what you normally say. Yeah, it's true. It is true. Um, but we are doing the podcast thing, and we have an awesome guest today, so we're super excited to get to him. But first, we want to just remind you that if you're enjoying this podcast and mm-hmm. you're getting a lot out of it, we would love for you to leave us a five-star review and yes. subscribe to us on iTunes Yeah. so we can continue to get awesome guests for you to listen to and to provide excellent content to you guys in the new year, Yes. in 2019, which 100%. is happening soon. Yeah, and if you're not an iTunes user, yes, you may or may not know this, but our, our podcast pushes to pretty much everything. It's Absolutely. on Spotify, it's on YouTube, it's on iHeartRadio, it's on Stitcher. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of excuses <laughs> out there. You can also just, just listen to it on our website. Right. <laughs> you know. It's everywhere. It's, it's out everywhere there. that you are. Right. It's true. <laughs> as long as you have internet. Yes, absolutely. And um, a quick mention for programs that are coming up in the new year. Obviously, mm-hmm. we've got, um, this will come out on Sunday, which yes. will be the 30th. Yes. So our programs for the new year kind of officially kick off on the 7th. Correct. So we figure folks are still recovering from New Year's Eve and kind of making their way into the new year. So um, we've got a bunch of stuff kicking off on the 7th, including Unveil Your Wellness, which is our signature holistic wellness challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and along with that goes our 21-day guided meditation challenge, 10-minute guided meditations written by me, written and recorded by me for you so that you can start to discover a deeper sense of well-being and, you know, just connecting with that inner voice yeah. in the new year. Get your head right. Get your head right, yes. And we've also got your our Build Your Plate Challenge, which is a great simple challenge that helps you build out your plate and the perfect proportion sizes for you. Yes. So you no longer have to guess if you're eating the right macronutrient ratios, if you're building your plate, plate so to speak, for the right composition for your body and weight, size, all that good stuff. We give you simple, easy ways to measure and make your plate up so that you effortlessly can lose or maintain weight depending on what you're trying to do. Or gain. Or gain. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I always forget there's people like Adam Lambert out there trying to gain weight. Yeah, just walking around (laughs) eating everything. Um, And then we've also got our pull-up challenge and our build a better booty challenge. So if you want to get in and do some glute training, you know that's one of our favorite challenges. We love it. We build strong glutes, um, hamstrings, quads, all that good stuff. And then the pull-up challenge is a great complement to that to get some upper body strength and conditioning as well. 100%. Yeah. So we've got lots of stuff coming in in the new year. Pick your poison. Mm-hmm. Pick your purpose. Pick your passion. Wow. <laughs> poison, purpose. Po- that could almost be a podcast in and of itself. Right? It could be three podcasts. Yeah. Poison, purpose, passion. Huh. Yeah. Absolutely. So we just wanted to give you guys all that good stuff. So as you're making your plans for the new year, you can hop in and um, join in with us on some of these fun and really beneficial beneficial and the word i'm looking for is effective effective <laughs> effective yes. programs yes <laughs> efficacy yes so let's get on to our guest pete evans yeah pete evans is so cool yeah he's cool he's really cool and he's so- australian which makes him like sound cool yes yeah, but then he's also really cool <laughs> well yeah we have a soft spot for the aussies because they're just 
nice. They're fun. They're funny. Like, they're just our people. Yeah. It sure seems like it. As a whole. Yeah. yeah. I've never met an Aussie I didn't like, to be I know. Fair. Me too. And I, I, I really like, haven't. I've, and I've actually met quite a few. Yeah. Like, they travel a lot, and so do we. So we come yes. across Australians all the time. Yeah. The thing may be, though, and I've thought about this, is it that all of them are cool, or is it the ones that travel to the same places that, or the ones that are interested in the same things that we are interested in? Could is be. Is that where that connection shows up? I will say that I've never gone to Australia and tried to surf some of the more localized breaks. Right. I may have a completely different opinion if I yeah. try to go drop in on some of the, you know, more yeah. coveted breaks yeah, in local Australia. Because I've heard that it's they a are a little aggressive in yeah. that arena. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I was actually surfing with an Australian guy who I got on with quite well in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me stories about people getting zipped up in board bags and thrown off the cliff. Yeah. 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 So I think that might be where their aggression lies. <laughs> However, I've had nothing but good experiences with them surfing in different parts of the world. Yeah. So, especially as a female, I don't know uh, what the deal is, but they've always been really cool with yeah. me. So. I think the bottom line is that we can just say Australians are cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think we're good with that. Yes. And Pete is one of them. Yeah. And, um, and he's also a surfer. So, maybe if we go with him surfing, we won't get zipped up in board out. bags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go with a local and you... you you manage just fine. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so anyway, let's talk about Pete. Pete is a chef, and he began his career at the age of 19, and he's opened numerous award-winning restaurants nationally as well as cooking in some of the finest restaurants globally. Pete's career spans professional kitchens where you can find him cooking and consulting in new mes in on, <laughs> on new restaurants, menus, and concepts to mainstream media with numerous television and film appearances. His latest project is the award-winning documentary film The Magic Pill, which shows the impact food can have on people's health now streaming globally on Netflix. He has been co-host and judge of Australia's number one television show, My Kitchen Rules, for nine seasons. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of seasons. That is. It's um, most of them. For it's most, most shows. of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's hosted and produced two seasons of The Paleo Way, which is a television series which sees Pete Pete creating delicious non-inflammatory dishes with special guests from around the globe and interviewing some of the world's leading experts on health and wellness. Yeah. This guy's up to big things. He is. Yeah. And, and he's doing it like in a in a very compassionate and just chill way. Exactly. <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. Yes, because sometimes when you're up to that much, you can come off a little, you know, like you're uptight. up to stuff. <laughs> but he comes off very chill and very loving and I think that's just who he is. So we're really excited to welcome him to the show and to share this conversation. And here we go. Let's chat with Pete. And we're live. Welcome to the podcast, Pete. Hey, thank you so much for having me. How are you today? Outstanding. Yeah, we're, we're rocking day. it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's really cool that we're connecting with you. We've been following your journey for a while. And actually, it's funny because I was looking through some email correspondence with you. And when I searched in my email, I noticed that you and I had corresponded way back when I was working for Mark Sisson at Primo Blueprint. And so mm -hmm. we've actually known each other longer than I even realized. <laughs> <laughs> that must be going back a few years now. It was actually. It was about six or seven years that I saw this email. So it was it was pretty funny. Um, and so you've done a lot in that time frame. And um, we'd love to just first take a moment to have you tell us a little bit about your background. And obviously, you have a long history as a chef, but we'd love to know, you know, were you always a paleo chef or how did this interest in the more ancestral approach come? Yeah, for sure. And funnily enough, I just interviewed Mark Sisson last week <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and just released his podcast a couple of days ago. So uh, it's, awesome. um, it, it's come full circle. Yep, totally. It always does. He's like the conduit for all things primal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, I guess uh, my story is, is unique, like everybody else's story is very unique to themselves. Uh, I, I became a chef basically to learn a life skill. And it was really to, as a vehicle to move out of home, to become independent and, and see the world as a 17 year old living on his own. And cooking was the, uh, cooking was the opportunity for me to live that lifestyle, to move out of home, to get a career and to get a career that could enable me to work anywhere in the world if I chose to. So that was, 
that was the impetus behind becoming a chef. Uh, it wasn't really a love of food, even though that followed and became one of my greatest passions is understanding food and, and creating delicious food. And I'm lucky to say that now I've cooked over a million meals with these two hands from owning restaurants wow. for over 20 years and working professionally as a, as a chef for 30 years now. So yeah, when it comes to food, I've had a lot of experience in uh, preparing and cooking and serving and eating it as well. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it was really interesting at the time when I did start off on my career as a chef, um, I also started partying pretty hard as well because those two things went hand in hand. And mm -hmm. it, w it wasn't until I was a, a few years into that journey of learning how to cook, dealing with a, a completely new industry uh, from being a child going through school into the big wide world of uh, hanging out with adults and seeing how they, how they spend their pastime or what they use mm -hmm. to get through a double shift, for instance. So it was, um, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you're, you're aware of Kitchen Confidential and uh, Anthea Bourdain's work mm -hmm. in, the, in that realm. And it's very true. At that particular point in time of my life, it was, it, it, it rang very true. So when I read, read Kitchen Confidential, I was like, uh-huh. Yep, that seems a bit right. Like, it didn't actually seem that crazy. Uh, and you speak right. to any chef in the world that has that has grown up in that in this industry over the last three or four decades, and everybody will have stories to tell of how crazy the industry is. But it was interesting mm -hmm. when I was nineteen, I became a uh, a partner in a, my family restaurant, and that also led to a different discovery for me because uh, my working weeks at that particular point in time were 60 to 80 hours per week being a chef. And that's mm -hmm. pretty much standard for anybody in the industry back then. And wow. But when you own your own restaurant, it actually goes up. <laughs> so right, uh, right. <laughs> I was pushing 80 to 100 to 110 hours per week for, for, wow. for, quite, for quite a – for nearly a couple of decades of my, my life. So what that led me to do was to research different ways of being able to cope with that uh, unnatural demand on my body. And the first, uh, the first opportunity I had to really understand how we could uh, utilize human potential was reading an Anthony Robbins book when I was 19 and subsequently going and doing his three-day event uh, in Sydney at the time. And uh, you walk over the coals and you, you're in a mm -hmm. stadium with 10,000 people and you're all chanting and you're all facing your fears and, and setting <laughs> goals. And, and I tell you what, if they could have taught that at school, what a different world we would have had. We, we would <laughs> right, have. I know. So yes, that, so true. That was a huge wake up for me for what human potential is, uh, how our belief systems work, uh, how negative belief patterns can rule our lives. So that that was a great catalyst for me for the work that I currently do now and how I live my life. And and there's been uh, some ebbs and flows, some ups and downs, some crashes along the way in understanding who Pete Evans is in in this world and it's you know I've experimented with different diets over the time I've experimented with not doing anything as well uh, I've experimented <laughs> with burning the candles at every single end that I can uh, I've experimented to being um, the total opposite of that meditating every day, making kombucha when I was 20, uh, living a, a mm. raw vegan diet with no alcohol, no drugs for, for many, many, many years. And so I've, I've put, I won't say my toe into different fields, but I've actually immersed myself into different beliefs and philosophies uh, mm. pretty intensely, inten intensely over the last couple of decades until um, – I discovered paleo and it was through my wife, Nicola. She was reading a book by Nora Gagaudis called Primal Body, Primal Mind about uh, mm -hmm. coming up to nearly eight years ago. And she knew that I was <laughs> a, a very experimental guy. And she said, oh, you might like to read this book. It's, it makes a lot of sense. So I re read it. I devoured it. I put it into practice. And um, eight, 
nearly eight years later, it's uh, it's still in practice, and I wow. feel that it it has the basis and foundation of some some amazing truth for long term sustainable health for myself and for my family, and uh, it's it's undeniable. I would say that a simple diet based around good quality meat and seafood and vegetables um, has has the potential and the power to cultivate long-term sustainable health uh, without mm. getting too confused by that. So, and, and the further I go along this path, the simpler I make it. And, the, and to the point where I don't even think about it anymore, it's just this is what I eat, this is how I cook it. I'm always looking for thousand and one ways of, of of interpreting that into delicious styles of food taken from ins- mm-hmm. taking inspiration from all over the globe so for instance last night we made a beautiful thai red lamb shank curry with cauliflower rice and mm-hmm. uh the night before we did roast pork with crackling just very classic uh, mediterranean style if you like and so every every day i try to inspire myself through cooking through different corners of the globe, so to speak, and different inspirations. So um, that's where I'm at at the moment uh, as far mm, as food, food goes and, and other philosophies. Um, I am, again, experimenting with different ways of expanding consciousness, uh, different ways of healing, uh, I guess, not, not so much physically but also emotionally. And, and that's also a journey that I've been on for the last 20-odd years is – understanding our patterns and understanding our limiting beliefs and also uh, developing the the capacity for more love, more understanding, more compassion, more acceptance, less judgment. And uh, these mm-hmm. things, these things come um, with, with a challenge wrapped around them because we have our egos wrapped around who we are and, and, and the cultural world that we live in. So I'm, I'm really enjoying this, uh, this experience of, of being Pete Evans for the last, uh, yeah. four and a half, four and a half <laughs> decades. And it was funny because even yesterday I was like, Fuck, I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's exactly it, right? The more you know, the less you know. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Um, so you, So you obviously you have a passion for food and cooking, but I want to just pause here for a second because you're talking about reinventing or being creative about the the types of meals, even if they're simplistic in their ingredients, you're trying to give them, you know, a new spark or a new flavor or, you know, at least be creative with them. But what do you tell, what kind of advice do you give to someone who just really doesn't like to cook? (laughs) Uh, My my first, (laughs) sorry if I laugh, but it's it's a funny one because... (laughs) It's good. <laughs> it, it's it's nearly like saying to an it, human beings are so stubborn, and mm-hmm. we, well, we can be. I shouldn't say we are. Uh, human beings can can create so many excuses for putting off the most vital things that are important to us, and that is what mm-hmm. I find so fascinating about our species. You know, I I'm sitting here on my farm and I'm watching my horses eat and i wonder if they ever have the thought oh i don't feel like eating today or (laughs) do you know what i want and i'm watching the birds go into the trees and they're and they're collecting their nectar or the pollen or whatever they're doing you know pecking for the for the insects that are there and again i just wonder is there anything going through their their mind that gives them doubt about what they're about to do, or is it instinctual? Mm-hmm. Whereas, I, I get that comment quite often, saying, "I find it a chore. I find it. Um, I don't like doing it." And uh, what are the alternatives? You know, unless you mm-hmm. can, unless you're rich enough to have somebody do it for you, which mm-hmm. majority of us cannot afford um you're going to have to get in there and just do it as as the slogan mm-hmm. goes from nike so my advice is it's it's not about how do we create joy out of it because that's easy you can put on some great tunes you can uh start to challenge yourself by 
by making an omelette, for instance, let's start with that or, or the perfect scrambled eggs. Let's start with something that has one ingredient or two ingredients into it. And let's master that. You know, you can challenge yourself in ways that you can make it enjoyable and make it fun. Uh, I just watched this great TV series this week. My wife and I binge watched it called Future Man. And if you haven't seen it, I, 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 I beg you to watch it because there's a great, <laughs> there's a great scene in it where this soldier comes back from the future and he has this wonderful realization through the series, and I don't want to give it away, but he has this realization that a human being can be capable of more than just one thing. And that was what I mm-hmm. always loved about the, the message that I got from Anthony Robbins back then. It was like, be a master, well, don't be a master of just one thing, but be, be competent in many areas, many different areas of your life. And I always thought that was such, such a, a smart, concept for us to take in because if you just become an expert in one thing then maybe you can't experience all these other things that we can uh intuitively and instinctively um put our passions and and learn to grow from so here's this guy that comes back from the future and and his his number one purpose he thinks a purpose in life is to kill people he's a soldier and win Mm. the battle but then he discovers cooking and and, and I love it. So when he first starts out, he doesn't know what to do. He's smashing the eggs on, on the kitchen bench. But within one episode of the series, he's like the expert chef. And he's he <laughs> has this passion for food that is so uh, – I, I just love it. So, So going back to we can create the passion around food by – challenging ourselves a little bit or putting ourselves into that that state or putting the music on or cooking, whatever it is. But it comes down to how do we change our belief system or our philosophy that it's not a chore, that mm-hmm. it's it's not painful, that you're not a victim, that you're not good enough to do it to create something delicious. That, I think, is the key. And to do that, you need to look at what – what are you passionate about in your life? What is it that makes you get up and want to live the life that you desire? And how can we translate that into the simple, and I, I will say it, it is a very simple act of being able to cook for yourself. And sure, mm-hmm. I have recipes that are elaborate in my books, but the majority of them are very simple. And you can adapt any recipe to suit your resources where you live, uh, your season, what's available, and your equipment or your cooking style or your taste. And you can, as I said, start with the basics. Cook a piece of steak and make a salad. Or you mm-hmm. can roast a pumpkin in the oven and at the same time um, steam a piece of fish, whatever it may be. And then if you want, you can make a dressing or a sauce to go with it. Or you can potentially mm-hmm. go to Whole Foods and buy a sauce like an like a, a flavoured mayonnaise or an aioli or some kraut and have that as your condiment. And you can start off so simply and then build and then build if you mm-hmm. choose to or just keep it right. simple. And then write, make a blog or share your recipes and say, I'm about to start this adventure. <laughs> you know, this is my first dish oh, I've ever so cooked. it's so true. And, and mm-hmm. have, have fun with it however you can. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the music because I'm a recovering, I don't like to cook person. <laughs> 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 and, and it has actually been a total game changer for me. It's like to set the energetic space of of the creation putting on music just kind of you know changing gears from my work brain into a more creative brain which is what cooking is you know it's like you can infuse that creativity and you can connect with that and so i have found that music has been a like a total game changer for my state of mind around the creation and now i'm actually enjoying it and i'm actually like you know putting together recipes at the beginning of the week. I would drag Adam into it and he helps <laughs> me and we, we make it so we can do together. And it's actually, it's become like a way that we, it's become part of our wind down routine, which we're always really serious about in terms of our sleep, like good sleep hygiene. We always, you know, talk about that on our podcast, how you can really create um, better sleep by having a sleep hygiene protocol. And we've almost mm-hmm. extended it 
from the dinner making part of our evening into the rest of our routine. And it really has made a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. That and and I, an instant pot. Yeah. <laughs> and the instant pot does not hurt. <laughs> well, exactly. And those slow, I actually did a cookbook a few years ago on slow cooking and pressure cooking. And, and, you know, if, the, if that's all you could do, I think that's probably the best way of cooking, especially when it comes to cooking bulk food. I mean, I talked about mm. the lamb curry we did yesterday, but two days prior, we put in four lamb shanks into the slow cooker and I cooked it overnight. And the next day we had all this meat and the day, the next day I cooked that uh, roast pork, but I cooked enough meat for two or three days. So we've always got meat mm -hmm. in there. And then yesterday I had some paleo bread and we made pate the day before. And I did that with my daughter. And mm -hmm. so we're having roast pork sandwiches on this delicious paleo bread and pate on the bread as well. And my wife made, crackers and she sometimes cooks for us or I cook for the family or we cook together and and we just have a lot of fun about it and I think going back to your original question how can people do it I think it comes down to having your values right and your philosophy on yourself right and I always say mm. to people the first step to undertaking a change in lifestyle or a change in diet is self-love and if you can see mm putting that food on the fork or chopsticks or in the spoon as the ultimate form of self-love and self-nourishment because ultimately there isn't, an, and again, I'll go back to the horses, they are intuitively and instinctively eating that grass because they know it nourishes them because they know that they just know that's their diet. And for mm. us, once we have that concept or that understanding of self-nourishment is the one of the easiest and most truest and purest ways of self-love. And when we're eating a diet that goes against that, that's actually self-harm. That's actually, mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not mm, worshiping yourself or nourishing yourself or honoring yourself. It actually is a form of, of pain. Yeah. And yeah, it's something that I think is a, it's a really interesting point to kind of hover on because there is this tendency, you know, and especially uh, one of the biggest, you know, sort of complaints or, or re reasons why I can't prepare my own food or eat more healthily is because I just don't have time. And I think that what you said and, and really looking at this as this as coming from a place of self love, it really is prioritizing yourself mm -hmm. over whatever other thing is eating up your time. And, you know, there's so much pressure. Um, I mean, certainly here, and I'm sure it's no different in Australia, where, oh, well, I have to get these hours in and I have to work this. and I've got to get this project done. And the next thing you know, there's just no time left in the day. And it can be a tough thing to to switch that around and start to prioritize yourself. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of us are kind of wired to put others first, you know, especially if that's the place where our paycheck comes from, you know, <laughs> and it's uh, I, so I think that looking at it as not something that you have to do, but looking at it, like you said, as a way of, of truly loving yourself and putting yourself in this position to be fundamentally set up for the, the best health and longevity might be a nice way for people to flip that switch. You're mm -hmm. like, ah, okay, you know, this is just like taking a bubble bath, you know, <laughs> something <laughs> I do for myself. And here it is. I'm going to cook my own food, you know. And I'll, I'll put it back to you is, is if you are a parent or a grandparent or you, you look after anybody, whether it be a pet, a it's exactly the same thing. And, and one thing that I love every time we feed our children and kids are 12 and 13 at the moment is they say, thank you for breakfast or thank you for lunch or thank you for dinner. And my response is always the same. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to nourish you. Mm -hmm. That's, that. it's as simple, it's as simple as that. It's an absolute mm -hmm. pleasure to be that. able to, to be able to nourish you as and that's one of the tools for nourishing your offspring or, or your children or your pet. You know, what are the other mm -hmm. ways that, that are a pleasure to be able to nourish you? Is it sitting and listening? Is it, is it talking? Is it doing fun activities? Is it playing? Is it, is it, uh, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, you know, is it a pleasure to be able to love yourself or somebody else in a, in a way that you don't expect anything in return. 
It's that's mm-hmm. called unconditional love. And mm-hmm. when you can do that to yourself with your lifestyle choices, don't expect anything in return from it. You know, because mm-hmm. so many people, when they embark on this journey, it's so f- fucking frustrating is yeah. after, mm-hmm. after four weeks, they're like, I haven't lost any kilograms or pounds. And I'm eating all this delicious food, you know, whether it be pa- <laughs> paleo or keto. And they want to give up because they've been on other diets where they've starved themselves and they've lost weight. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh. And my response to people is, how many decades did it take you or how many years did it take you to put on that weight? Because I'm sure it didn't take yeah. you four, four weeks. So why why are you putting these unnatural expectations on yourself that is based around an outcome instead of just self-love and self-nourishment and acceptance and hey this is this (laughs) and this is the other thing that I find really interesting it's like so if I do it for 10 weeks what happens then (laughs) <laughs> you know, like, I still need a time limit. <laughs> well, this 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 is a sustainable, long term way of life. If you choose choose it, and and I'll, I'll use that word choose, and I'll put some emphasis on that because everything we do comes down to our choice, not anybody else's, unless. You're a child and you're being cooked for and, and being dictated and uh, being guided in how you live your life. But as an adult, I could pretty much say most of us have free will to choose how we live our lives, who we spend our time with, what job we have, what food we put into our mouth, the type of beverages we consume, when we go to sleep generally, unless you're a shift worker, how much television we watch, how much time we look at a screen what we choose to put out into the world through social media or what we choose to uh, run away from or retreat from or hide from, how we choose to talk to ourselves, our inner dialogue. We have these choices. I don't know how many thousands of choices we make each and every single day, how we breathe, how we communicate, how we speak, how we move our bodies whether we go outside and touch the earth or whether we get a little bit of sun onto our skin, you know, all of these choices come back. And that's why the the interesting thing is when people do change their lifestyle or their choices in their life, um, that they expect something in return straight away instead of just giving yourself that unconditional love. I'm going to love you, mm. your, myself, unconditionally, with no expectations. But to do that, we're going to make some choices that enable us to cultivate that muscle of self-love. And I see food as the easiest, and I, I'll say that again, I see food as the easiest way to love ourselves because we have complete control over what we put into our mouths. Whereas some of the other thoughts that we have, some of our patterns can be a little trickier to to shed or to understand or to be aware of for us to actually grow from out of those experiences or out of those patterns. But food is a pretty simple one, I think. Mm. So um, listening to you speak, Pete, it's obvious you have a very sort of spiritual um, undertone or, a, you know, at least a a self-awareness that has obviously been cultivated from something. What are some of the things that you've done in your life to cultivate that, that deeper self-awareness or that deeper sense of self? Oh, usually the wrong things. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. And, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I don't mean wrong because everything we do is perfect because it helps us to, to live that experience. And we wouldn't have done it if it, if, if there wasn't something in it for us to learn from and to grow. So, um, uh, I, I guess I had, I had, I, I'd probably say I've had over a thousand different therapeutic sessions over my, my lifetime. And what I mean by that mm-hmm. is visiting different types of people that are experts, uh, and are passionate in their role of being what I would call a 
a, a human expert, uh, people that can help you access you. And, and here's the really interesting thing about that is that the further I go along this journey and this adventure I call life, the more that I've come to realize is that there are different people out there that have different skill sets and different talents. And it's nearly like a game, so to speak. And we can use these different, uh, uh, different people and different strengths and modalities for us to be able to help guide us and, and help access more about ourselves. And the simplest version of that is by looking at the relationships we have, whether it be a professional or romantic or even the relationships we have with our, with our family. And you will be able to learn so much about yourself if you actually take the time to see how you react in those situations. But then there's also other people that are, are trained therapists in different modalities that can mm -hmm. also help you to, uh, I guess, discover who you are. And I like to say that they, we all hold the key to our inner workings and our inner self, but some people can just help guide you to that keyhole with your own key, so to speak. So, um, mm -hmm. see, some people think uh, seeking out others to help them is a sign of weakness, whereas I, I see it as a sign of uh, adventure. And you might mm. in encounter mm -hmm. someone and you go, mm, I didn't really get too much from that person. Maybe I'll speak to someone else that uh, has been on this adventure and has had um, great results from speaking with somebody um, that does this type of work. And there's so many different modalities and the, the, you can do it by yourself through meditation and self-awareness and through uh, potential use of um, entheogens that... Um, Mm -hmm. I've looked into and, and interviewed people on this. Uh, then there's other people that are trained professionals, whether they're psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, NET practitioners like neuroemotional uh, therapy or technique. Then there's emotional freedom technique, which is tapping. And then there's, uh, if you can cr think of a, a concept out there, then somebody has probably created that. Um, so there's different ways to be able to access these. I guess, inner beliefs that we have adopted about ourselves and then we need to find out whether they're true or whether they are from other people or whether they're culturally or societal uh, driven or adopted for us. So it, that in it itself is a lifelong adventure to discover your true self and your true purpose. Mm -hmm. So if you've had, you know, over a thousand sessions, obviously a plethora of different modalities, are there a couple though that, that ring out in your mind where you knew that those were game changers? I mean, you mentioned Tony Robbins before, but is there others where you just say, oh yeah, I came into that as one person and I came out of it as somebody completely different or rather maybe more connected with who you really are, however you want to see it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it could be anything as well. So and I, I'm cautious here to, to not point anybody down a certain path because I think it's also mm -hmm. uh, everybody's individual accountability or responsibility to, to explore this for themselves. And it can be as simple as finding the sport or the activity that you love. Mm -hmm. And for, I, I guess mm -hmm. one of my greatest activities and, and pleasures is to go for a surf and or immerse mm. myself in the ocean and yeah. it's interesting and because I see a lot of people and I chose surfing as a sport and I had a lot of fear wrapped around the ocean when I was a child and I pushed myself to um, overcome that fear and I've had a few pretty pretty um, I had one life-threatening injury when I was 14 I was run over by a surfboard and fractured my skull and had 50 stitches and it was it was pretty close oh, wow. there and that was mm. again uh it it frightened me and but I was determined to get back out there and I'm 45 now and I, I think I'm surfing better than I ever have in my entire life and I'll be doing it for 30 years mm, but awesome. and my goal is to be able to do it when I'm 100 and it's an it's an interesting thought that I've had or, or challenge that I've set myself and I'm not uh, crazy about it. And I was listening to um, Kelly Slater, the, the 
11 time world champion mm-hmm. surfer the other day he was on Joe Rogan and it was fascinating because I know I've I've read a lot about Kelly Slater and I've we've met him before but he said something that was really quite profound and he said he wants to surf to to be a very uh, old age as well but when he competes and he's still competing in his 46 at the moment he's competing against 18 year old kids on the world tour but what he said was that he doesn't overtrain his body because he wants his body to be there for him to be able to do the things that he wants to do into old age. And I, th- he goes, I do the bare minimum required to be able to compete at that level and be able to catch two high scoring waves in 30 minutes. But I don't overtrain because I want my body to look after me. And I thought that was such a, mm. a wonderful thing to hear from a, from an elite athlete. And, yeah. and, and he is probably regarded as the most influential, almost accomplished athlete of all time that we know of because uh, the amount of world titles and the, the longevity that he's been going for. So yeah. going back to your question, I love surfing and I find that that is one thing that brings me so much clarity about myself and, <laughs> excuse me, and to be able to go for a surf is very cleansing and very energetic. And I find that one of the best tools for uh, renewal or regeneration and for joy and for, and for wonder and for anticipation and for excitement and for a little bit of uh, terror sometimes and a bit of uh, <laughs> a bit of reflection as well and and it's amazing how many uh, realizations come out from just being able to sit out there in the ocean whether it's swimming or whether it's sitting oh, yeah. on a board waiting for a wave so I see that as a, a wonderful form of therapy as well And I guess I've probably had tens of thousands of sessions of therapy out there, just like anybody who meditates every day has had tens of thousands of sessions. So find what works for you and maybe you can become an expert in one or going back to what we said before, be very uh, capable in many of these uh, different modalities. Mm. Yeah, surfing has been one of my greatest teachers as well. And I think it's funny when I was living in Hawaii for a few years, my good, one of my good girlfriends used to always invite me to church on Sundays. And I would just say, I am going to church. Like I'm going to my church, which is out in the ocean, (laughs) you know, and because it really, it was always, um, just such a spiritual experience for me and still remains to be that. And one of the best teachers for sure. I am glad that you mentioned that. Um, so I want to get to your documentary, The Magic Pill, that you've recently created. Tell us a little bit about the documentary. And what I'd really love to know was, what was your hope for people to discover through this film? Sure. So The Magic Pill came about, it was um, basically a two-step process. Because the first was, the first part was, we made a two- season um, TV series called The Paleo Way. Uh, Season two is now on Netflix. Season one is on iTunes at the moment, and hopefully we'll get season one out on Netflix soon as well. So these were two uh, eight-episode, 30-minute cooking series. And from that, we traveled through the United States as well as Australia and also the United Kingdom, and we interviewed some some pretty amazing people like Mark Sisson, as we, we mentioned before, Nora Gagoudis, who we've mentioned, and other experts in this field. And during that time, we had all of this wonderful content that obviously we couldn't put into a 30-minute cooking series because every episode had four recipes. And we'd have these very small sort of snippets of these wonderful interviews that, that we conducted. And I said Mm -hmm. to my producer, Rob Tate, who worked with me on the the magic pill, I said, can we turn this into a documentary? And he said, yeah, I think we can. I said, because the other reason was that season one was picked up by a distribution company and it, they never got, they never were able to manage to get it out there to a wide audience in English speaking countries. It's in, It's in foreign countries on streaming platforms, but they couldn't get it into English-speaking territories. So I basically gave season two of The Paleo Way to Netflix 
for free just to get it out there because it's so important that this is these messages get out there i believe so and i also thought maybe the cooking series isn't the right time to be for people to be uh gravitating towards this maybe if we just make a 90 minute documentary it's it's easier to digest than eight 30 minute episodes so we went about basically taking the the essence of the paleo way and turning it into a documentary where we actually followed people that adopted this lifestyle over 10 weeks and we filmed with the indigenous australians you know a wonderful place called elko island with a wonderful couple that have started a charity or a foundation called Hope for Health, and they do these retreats where they take the indigenous for two weeks and they put them, uh, feed them basically a low carb paleo approach, which is their <laughs> their original diet. Um, mm-hmm. right. And we also filmed in America. We filmed people with type two diabetes and showed how that could be reversed and get off the medication. We also filmed with uh, a young girl with autism and epilepsy and showed the the remarkable change that could happen just by changing the diet to be one with, with more fat and, and less um, inflammatory foods. So, and we managed to get a, uh, a different distribution company to get this out there. And I was like, can we get this on Netflix? Can we please get this on Netflix? And they were like, we don't think that's <laughs> possible. You know, Netflix are very choosy and it's pretty hard to get something onto Netflix, I've got to say. Because mm-hmm. there's no one to contact, so um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we 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 released it onto iTunes and Amazon, and it had such a great uh, response that they've managed to to get it to the right person to see, and, and Netflix picked it up, and they just released awesome. it in English speaking countries to start with, and after three months, we got the message that they were going to release it globally and and dub it and subtitle it into all their platforms because it had done so well for them um wow. so, so that is fantastic and we're so that's the, amazing the the impetus behind it or, or the intention behind that film was to create something that people that had already been on this journey would be able to refer their family and friends or work colleagues to watch something that wasn't going to take up too much of their time that was succinct enough and covered enough of the the main points about this way of life, which is optimal human health, the reversal or the improvement of many uh, chronic related lifestyle health diseases, as well as sustainability of our planet and what that means with real information out there and not biased propaganda based um <laughs> information that seems to be flooding the internet and documentaries at the moment mm-hmm. so a balanced view of that also wanted to show the uh, the corruption of the food industry and we ha- we were able to do that through our friend Timothy Noakes's trial in South Africa and <clears throat> and also show and and pay respect to indigenous cultures around the world and and really highlight and show how their wisdom and and I'll I'll, I'll refer back to our horses on the land here at the moment we once instinctively and intuitively knew what to eat as a species as a human species without being told how to do it very much like every other species on the planet intuitively knows how to eat and why they have to eat. So that was a, a, a very strong uh, theme that I wanted to include in the film and pay respect and homage to the indigenous peoples around the world because they had it right. <laughs> and we as modern folk have uh, ha- have have detoured off the path from nature and that was what we wanted to, I guess, emphasise in the film in a respectful way as well. So I'm sure I've left something out from the, from the, from, from the intention of the film, but that, they're, they're the key points that are popping out to me at, at presently. Awesome. awesome. Well, and people can go watch it and get the full meal deal. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it was really well done. Very impressive. And it was, um, 
it, you know, obviously it's hard to create something that's non-biased, but it really did come across as really trying to come at this from a non-biased angle. So I, that really did come across for me. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we didn't even use the word paleo once and we didn't attack any other, uh, philosophy or belief and it was interesting because that mm -hmm. uh it was in the first couple of cuts and our uh, edits um uh, my director rob did put a couple of those things in and i was like no 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 no, this is not what i want yeah. to present to the world we want to present something that mm -hmm. that isn't bashing anybody but just just showing the i guess for instance the multinational food industries we didn't go super hard on that we just presented the facts without it being a film about how how demonizing they can be towards uh science and information and funded funded science i should say so and and i guess the other theme that we really wanted to show was that and i think we did it or we didn't do it but the the participants did uh that we followed on their journey was that self-love that we we were talking about before we had Barry who's the father of Abigail who just wanted to nourish his daughter uh we had mm. uh the nurse who had type 2 diabetes who was overweight and she just wanted to give herself that self-love and nourishment and we we ha I feel like we that came through organically and is probably the 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 trigger or the main key, I think, for people wanting to adopt or even accept that this could be an option for them from those emotional cues from these wonderful people that let us follow them on their journey. And they showed their raw emotion and they showed them wanting to love themselves because they're at the point in their life where something had to change. Mm. That's incredible. I mean, the, those stories, I think, translate so much better than just page after page of, you know, sales copy trying to get people to come and do something. <laughs> so I, you know, I can't, um, I can't recommend it enough for people to go check it out. And while we're on the topic of checking things out, where, where else can people get more of you? What's the, what's the best place for folks to learn more about Pete Evans and what you've got going? Well, we've actually got a program that goes for 10 weeks, uh, called the Paleo Way and it's free. There's no, no strings attached. It's a um, it's a ten week program that has all of those interviews that we were talking about that we did with these these experts from around the world in long form, so people can go and watch an hour long interview with Mark Sisson or Nora Gagaldis mm. or Dr. McCola or David Perlmutter, for instance, uh, Natasha McBride, all these uh, Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. We have all these videos and blogs in this one program. And we have 350 recipes plus and all of this information that's in there and it's completely free. So if anyone is interested, they can go to the paleoway.com. That is um, our, our gift to, to the world at the moment. It's completely free. So um, discover it. And we have really simple recipes or really elaborate ones for, for everybody. <laughs> I, I like to have something for everybody. And uh, so check that out. Otherwise, um, social media, we're, we're, on Instagram and Facebook, uh, you can see us and, and check out those uh, TV series on Netflix as well as uh, iTunes. Thanks for joining us, Pete. And for folks that are looking for him on Instagram, it's at Chef Pete Evans. And you can also, of course, find all of his details at PeteEvans.com. And for folks that are looking for something to do in the new year, remember, go to BeTheWellness.com. You can check out all of our programs that are kicking out off on January 7th, including our full Unveil Your Wellness Meditation Challenge, Build a Better Booty Program, Pull Up Challenge, and Build Your Plate Challenge. So lots of awesome stuff kicking off in Be The Wellness. Pick your passion, get in there, and we'll see you next week. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye. And not a